Live from Lincoln Center is underwritten by General Motors and its Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, Cadillac, GMC truck divisions, and GMAC. General Motors, committed to excellence. Live from Lincoln Center is also made possible by grants from the Robert Wood Johnson Jr. Charitable Trust and the National Endowment for the Arts. Good afternoon. I'm standing in the wings of Alice Tully Hall. Now this is not the best known of Lincoln Center's concert halls, but I think it is one of the best loved by musicians and audiences. The concert goers are assembled here today to hear a performance by the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center. And again, this society is not the most famed institution to call Lincoln Center home. But while the Metropolitan Opera and the New York Philharmonic may be more widely known, no ensemble generates more affection than the Chamber Music Society. Its audience is uncommonly loyal. And musicians, whether they're members or guest players, seem to have a deep commitment to the group. If you're new to the society, I think you're going to see why. This is a group of friends, all successful soloists, who clearly love playing together. Their joy is communicated to their audiences, and as a result of that, their concerts have the warmth and intimacy of a family event. And that, of course, is what chamber music is all about. At intermission, I'll be speaking with David Schifrin, who makes his debut this season as artistic director. Soloist Ransom Wilson and John Browning will also be joining me to talk about the program and what it tells us about the special character of this ensemble. Right now it's time for the music of Mozart. I'll see you later.
Well, David, here you are, a world-renowned soloist, and you're new guys as, as a rookie, I guess I can say. Because, <laughs> and I'm going to ask you a question that you may have asked yourself several times in the last few days. What made you want to become artistic director of this organization? Well, it really is a lot of fun. Uh, there's so much great music, so many different combinations of instruments, and it's just fun putting these things together. And I guess I'm a rookie here at, at Lincoln Center doing this job, but I've been doing it for years and years and years. I have a summer festival in Portland, Oregon that plays chamber music for, for weeks, every, for a month and a half every summer. And I just got in the habit of uh, putting groups together to play different pieces of music, and now I'm doing it here. Yeah. Now, I know you, you programmed this with great care and thought. Is there anything about the selections on this particular program <laughs> that, that speak to uh, your 
your uh, intentions and your goals for the organization? Well, being the first concert under my direction, the first concert that I planned, I wanted to have a real celebration for the first concert and to set a tone, a joyous tone. This concert is, if there's one theme, it's that it's all really happy music. Of course, there are moments of uh, introspection and, and expression and, and even melancholy, but the, from the Mozart through the Saint-Saëns to the Ravel that you just heard, and of course the Trout Quintet on the second half, it's really happy, ebullient music, and uh, I'm very pleased with how it's going. Uh, Ransom, the, the chamber music is very often composed for a special occasion or a specific individual, and I'm wondering what, uh, what were the reasons that these particular selections were composed? Well, the, the, the Ravel, which is such an incredible piece, was really written to, to show off the chromatic harp, and no one uses the chromatic harp to play it anymore. It's a, a, the chromatic harp was an instrument that had crossed strings, if you can imagine it. Uh, but we, we almost lost this piece, which is the, the, an amazing story. He, was, he had written it, he was so happy he'd written it, he wanted to buy all new clothes. He went to a shirt shop in Paris and bought a whole bunch of new things and then went immediately on a, on a Seine River trip for the afternoon, never remembering that he had left his score, his mm. manuscript, in the shirt shop. And this was the only copy? The only copy. <laughs> and uh, luckily, it was a music lover who in fact knew who Mr. Ravel was and knew him as the composer of Judo, his famous piano piece. Uh, but we almost lost it. I think so. We, and we know now that he should have thrown that down on a disc from his hard drive. And <laughs> his <computer laughs> there you go. Right. There you go. Didn't that happen to some other composer? It, it, it was either uh, Mendelssohn or Saint-Saëns who left a manuscript in a carriage someplace. And, oh. and I think and said said to someone, "Well, I'll write it down again." I mean, uh, if it's all in the mind memory, boggling when yeah. you think of it. There are a number of scores that are lost forever, and it, and I'm just so glad that we have this. The uh, the Schubert, I believe, in the original manuscript is is, is yeah. missing, and it was reconstructed from the the parts from that the have parts? been copied. Yeah, that would be a way. And if you look through um, catalogs and, and uh, encyclopedias, you see uh, letters that composers wrote referring to works that they wrote that are lost forever. So maybe, maybe somewhere in an attic in Prague or a basement in Budapest, someday sure. they'll find a, another quintet of Dvorak or a. Right. Quartet of Mozart. Now these last two things that we heard, the, the, I understand, were published in the same year, the Saint-Saëns and the Ravel, and they don't sound as if they were published in the same year. What's the reason for that, either of them? Well, there was so much going on in the first decade of this century, and of course uh, Saint-Saëns, the bulk of his life was in the 19th century, and his, his musical style was still such a, a romantic, uh, style from the 19th century, and of course Ravel was part of the new uh, beginnings of Impressionist uh, using different scales and colors and, and chords, uh, and so it was really quite a crossroads to hear these two works with harp written in the same year of very right. different styles. One sounding like it's leaning forward and the other looking back a little bit, I guess. But both still really yeah. alive today, pieces, I think. Right. Yeah. When, when a piece of chamber music is performed in, in a different place, I'm thinking now somebody's drawing room, or, uh, or in, a, in a concert hall, which this is, is it, it's different enough. Do you have to kind of reinvent or um, reinterpret for, uh, in, for performance, depending on where it's performed? Absolutely. The, most of these pieces, as you say, were written for very small spaces. And, uh, and here we are in, a, in what, what's really a rather large concert hall. So I think that we, we tend to, to take, take our tempo, we choose our tempos t for, for a bigger room so that, that they'll be understandable in a bigger room. Uh, it's, they're, they're all nice experiences. I mean, it's sure. wonderful to play chamber music in someone's living room. I've done that a lot. Uh, on the other hand, there's a lot of pressure to that. You really have to, you have to be, everything has to be completely excellent. Uh, or certainly that's how we feel, I think. David would agree with me. It's just we feel like there's lots of pressure. Too, yes, they're looking at you. They're watching down your, down, breathing down your neck, as it were. Right. So uh, in the hall, it's, it's, we can feel like, oh, okay, it's a concert. We, we're right. okay. <laughs> Nobody's going to hurt us. Of course, no two rooms are alike, and uh, there are some homes that I'd love to play in uh, acoustically, and they're, they're very comfortable, and there are other places where, where it doesn't help the instrument at all to be playing into the drapes and the carpet, and the sound <laughs> just stops yourself. right yeah, there. Yeah, you know? right. that would not be good. But th I think that this particular concert hall, being smaller than the other ones at Lincoln Center and having probably the best acoustics around uh, for chamber music, is really a good compromise between a large concert hall, like the 
like the Avery Fisher Hall, the Metropolitan Opera, or somebody's home for playing chamber music. This is really, seems as ideal. concert go, halls go, it's just wonderful. It seems to be very, very much respected by, by musicians and I guess by audiences. Yeah, we too. always enjoy playing here. Chamber music, one of the unusual things about it is no conductor is involved. And I, I have a question. When, when you have individuals, three, four, five, or more uh, good soloists playing together, Considering the hundreds of decisions regarding tempos and, and uh, phrasing and so forth, who makes those decisions? How does it work? Well, it's amazing how easily it can work when, when you have a group on this level. For example, this last Ravel piece, which has seven people, we could potentially have a disaster on our hands because we could have seven conductors, as you say. And in fact, like the beginning, for example, says très lent, it's very slow. And what does that really mean? How slow is very slow? How slow, slow is very slow. And, and we, had, we had several opinions the first day when we said, well, no, you know, it's really too slow. Somebody would say, well, but I, it really needs to be, to be faster because, because my breath, I can't hold my breath that long, or I can't hold the bow that long, that, that, that kind of thing. Of course, then the harpist might say it can't be any faster than that. I have to play 32 notes in that space <laughs> of time. Right. <laughs> That's right. And so, but somehow so then we you, reach a consensus. Somehow you, you manage to, to, to find a middle ground and, and at this, again, at this level where everybody respects everyone enormously, there's an amazing kind of diplomacy that happens, which is really, really funny yeah. to see. I think if people get along, yeah. I think if somebody were to come from the outside and watch one of our rehearsals, they'd be very amused by how much diplomacy we use. You know, because we can always tell when somebody's going to say something bad because they always preface it with something really nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I imagine a really good artist is going to want the finished product to sound right, and therefore, if he's going to hold out for his own way to the detriment of the overall effect. Uh, he's not as great an artist. Exactly, and with enough rehearsal time, we can experiment and try. If there are seven people in the group with seven different opinions, we can try it seven different ways, and then we're all hearing a lot about the democratic procedure these days. Maybe then we can vote on it, and certainly with a group of seven players, um, <laughs> we can finally come to an agreement. And then when it comes to the performance, to, um, we all play it the way we've agreed to play it, not, and, and, not, and hopefully not going in different directions. Yeah. Now, chamber music, as I understand it, it's it's a little tougher to play than some other kinds of music. The rehearsal, it takes longer to rehearse and the pay is less. I can understand the enthusiasm about it as a listener, <laughs> but as a performer, why are musicians enthusiastic about chamber music? You want to go first? <laughs> sure. It's, it's the sharing that, that's involved. Uh, it's because you're not you're not the soloist. You're able to actually share the experience of, of, of these these great works of art with your colleagues, and that's really it's the it's the greatest challenge and the greatest pleasure yeah, when it works. I bet it is. Before before we wrap up this part of the uh, of the interview, I wanted to ask you, David, about about your thinking in um, inviting John Browning to be a part of what we're going to hear now, the Trout Quintet. What well, was your thinking? Well, it's traditional at the Chamber Music Society to have a group of resident musicians, all of whom have their, their uh, own solo careers and really are quite successful. But um, it's also traditional to have a few guest artists who come in and shake us up a little and uh, have different ideas and, and try to choose people who are stellar musicians and who are wonderful to work with. And I learned 20 years ago about John Browning, when I was a student, um, he was coaching a student group at the, uh, the Kent State University Festival with the Cleveland Orchestra, and I was a student then. And um, we were doing a work of Mozart for winds and piano. The pianist was extremely talented, but extremely irresponsible. I, I can't remember his name. If he's watching today, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but he didn't show up, the student pianist. And uh, John Browning just sat down and played with us, and, and I'll never forget that. And it meant so much to us as students to play with a great artist like, like Mr. Well, Browning. I sure look forward to hearing this, this uh, last work, and I'm going to be talking to John Browning. Uh, just great, after great. See if he even remembers it. <laughs> Thank you both, and great pleasure talking, talking to both of you. We'll be back in a moment. Thank you. John Browning, I have to start by asking you to comment on the difference between performing as a solo uh, artist with an orchestra maybe accompanying you, and in chamber music it's not accompaniment, you're part of a group. Do you have to shift gears? I'm part you? of a group and I'm also playing an instrument which is nine feet long and which uh, makes violinists very nervous because their instrument is about that <laughs> long <laughs> and they always are sure that we're going to drown them out and it's very possible to do so. Uh, 
when I first uh, started chamber music up at Marlboro, Mr. Rudolf Serkin, the great uh, pianist and founder of Marlboro, said to me, we were doing the uh, Brahms F minor quintet, and he said, uh, oh, John, we use full lid here. Just put the lid all the way up, and uh, well, the Brahms is a big piece. And uh, at the end of the scherzo, I, as an inexperienced chamber player, had managed to drown out the strings, so Mr. Sergan just quietly came along, got up on stage, lowered the lid to half stick, <laughs> didn't say a word, but that made it you very clear that I hadn't <laughs> learned how to do it yet. It's a special kind of touch and a special way of pedaling so that you don't drown out this. And strings. you can still get the kind of dynamic range you want. That's what you a, try to do. You right. try to play with discretion, but with passion. On the matter of teamwork, are there artists who are good performers who do not have the temperament or the, or the will to cooperate with a group? And yes, do it? there are people who are fantastically wonderful soloists, but they do not have the ability to merge ideas with other people. Right. So they, they can't fit. And they're not, they're not good for chamber music. I've heard the metaphor used by musicians of conversation applied to a kind of description of right. chamber music. Is, is that applicable? To yes. Uh, in fact, that's the way the composer writes it. Uh, tonight, for example, Annie will set forth this uh, theme in the violin, and then it'll be carried to the viola, and then I'll have it. It's as if we're all taking a subject and talking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we play it back and forth. And one of the things you do is keep quiet when the other person is talking. So there is a give and take. That, is it analogous to the, uh, while it isn't impro to improvisational, to jazz musicians working together and kind of reading each other's yes, minds? Yes, it's not a, at all unlike that. And during the performance, no matter how much we may talk about ideas in rehearsal and, and agree democratically on it, in performance is a certain electrical thing that takes over. And sometimes the performance just does its own thing, and we all follow, or one of us will do something that sounds nice and the others will imitate it. Yeah. So there, there's the, the thing of the moment that nobody can predict. Is there any advice that you might have for your uh, erstwhile pupil who's now directing this whole thing as to how to steer an organization like this? Well, it was very funny because 20 some years ago at Kent State, I was in the, uh, in the hall telling them what the balance should be and Yesterday, when we had a rehearsal, David was in the hall telling us, you know, piano a little more or a little less, so the, the shoes are on different feet. The Trout Quintet, as I understand it, was not really terribly important during Schubert's life, and it now is a monument. What's the reason for that? What, what is there about it? Well, so much of Schubert's music didn't get any kind of uh, performance or recognition until the early part of the 20th century when people like Schnabel and uh, some of the conductors like Richard Strauss began to push the, the Schubert uh, music. Now we have a, a, a vote that's been taken among the Chamber Society regular subscription members, and the Trout Quintet is their most favorite chamber work. Is that right? Well, it wears well, I'll say and that. It's, it has a lightness and a beauty. It's thrown in a high register because of the double bass, the double. and so all of the rest of us are playing very high, so there's a kind of an aerial effect as if we're up in the air. The very opening arpeggio of the piano is like, I always think of a bird flying. Yeah taking off from the ground. And still there are thoughtful passages that could almost be called dark, like in the yes, second movement. Yes, kind of dark there. clouds that pass over right. um, every now and then, but there's basically a sunny quality that remains. Right. I guess you need a broad palette, though, if you're writing something of the length this is. You know, it's unusual movements. formally because it's in five movements, which is yeah. very unusual for a chamber work. And of course, the song was written first. And then the person who commissioned the work, Mr. Palmgartner, it's a great name, Sylvester Baumgartner, yeah. decided to uh, commission Schubert to do it in the hometown of Herr Johann Vogel, who was the, the uh, singer that did so much of the, of the Schubert songs. Was the it Palmgartner's idea to base, base some of the theme on, on the Trout song? Yes, or, uh, yes. it was his idea, and Schubert said sure, and it was his idea to use the double bass, and Schubert said yes. 
I see. So it's, uh, and it was uh, unusual, but it's unusual, true. and it has Builder. not been done very much since. You would have thought other composers would have taken up the idea. But Absolutely. They didn't. Well, we sure look forward to hearing that Thank now. You. I'll have to let you go because you're going to get out and perform it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Right.
Thank mm-hmm. you.